um, from inside U.S. trade. And maybe you want to summarize that, if you don't mind, Sharon, just briefly. Well, basically, I just referred to this when I was giving my summary, but it's about the Obama administration drafting the legislation that they would need to submit in order to have the TPP considered in the lame duck session. So, you know, it looks like the Obama administration, whether they submit that bill or not, he hasn't done that, but there is kind of a time frame that's attached to the um, Trade Promotion Authority or, or Fast Track legislation. And in order for this uh, TPP to be considered in the lame duck, the administration has to go through a number of steps. And they are, in fact, starting to prepare those, those materials uh, for possible submission in this conference. So this is? Is an overview of the FDA negotiations. And Sharon, you're prepared to go for it, huh? OK, well, thank you. I, I'm just going to give a real quick snapshot of some of what I know that might be happening or might not be happening. <laughs> so it's just starting with the Trans-Pacific Partnership. As Locke mentioned, there's been a lot of talk about a potential lame duck session. What I can say is this. My understanding is that the President and the Congress must do certain things um, under the fast track legislation in a, on a certain timetable if they're going to actually have a vote within that lame duck session. So there have been some hearings that took place just this last week, I believe, or the week before, uh, that were kind of generally untrade, but talking about the, there, there was an egg hearing, agriculture hearing before the Ways and Means Committee. Uh, and President Obama has said publicly that he's pushing for this to be done in a lame duck session. That said, I'm not sure I would agree with Locke's assessment that a lame duck session is likely, but maybe uh, <laughs> others who are more close to Congress or members of Congress would know. What, one thing I do know is that at least based on the counts that civil society and, you know, labor unions and nonprofits and others have, um, they say that there simply are not the votes in the House at least to, to pass the TPP right now. Now, that of course can always change. Uh, but that, and you know, this is something that is unlikely to be brought up uh, unless it could be passed. So, but it is certainly a possibility, and so this assessment is very well timed, because as we all know, a lame duck is after the election. Um, so, just going through the other thing that happened recently, which is a prerequisite in order to have the uh, Congress uh, review the Trans-Pacific Partnership, is that there was this International Trade Commission economic. Uh, report that was done, which is the one I was referring to. There have been quite a bit, there's quite a bit of literature critiquing it um, that's interesting, and it's all very interesting reading if, if people want to delve into that themselves. Um, and so that's sort of all I'll say about the TPP. On the, um, and this is where the frequently asked questions on TTIP or the Transatlantic Agreement. Um, Basically, one of the things that's happened recently on that is that there was a huge leak of um, U.S. as well as European Union proposed text. And um, this is noteworthy because even though the European Union has been posting its uh, proposals, the United States never, never publicly releases any of its proposals. And in the Trans-Pacific Partnership, those that the U.S. proposals were, were not leaked. But in this case, there was a leak, and so it's quite instructive if anyone's interested in looking at it it's a, on, a pub, on public websites. And what's useful is that it shows both the European Union proposals and the U.S. proposals together. And you can see what they've agreed on, which isn't very much, and what they haven't agreed on yet. And then there's a very interesting memo that's called the Tactical State of Play, which is written by the European Union. This is a leak that came from the European Union side, not from the U.S. side, which talks about what things they made progress on and what things are uh, difficult. Uh, and I would just say that there's been a whole lot of stuff um, with uh, folks like Angela Merkel, who, who's the head of the, the German government, uh, and, and others trying to downplay expectations that they will conclude this negotiation within this year. I, I, I think it's highly unlikely myself, uh, but of course one never knows because these, these all take place behind closed doors, so um, who knows. Um, 
I will say one thing that it might affect the TTIP, uh, the transatlantic negotiations, is that there's a vote, I don't know if it's today or it's this week, uh, in um, England. Thursday. Thursday, okay, whether or not the Great Britain and the United Kingdom will get out of the European Union. And nobody really, I mean, I've heard things both directions, whether that would help or hurt the negotiations around TTIP. Uh, you know, the Obama's, President Obama's been very clear that this, if Britain gets out, that doesn't mean they're going to be cutting some separate trade deal with the U.S. So if they want an agreement with the U.S., they need to stay in. Uh, it happens that the U.K. has been one of the most strongest proponents of doing this um, trade agreement. So if they're out, does that mean there's less steam to, to do it? Maybe. But then again, if they're out, maybe the rest of, the, of Europe thinks it's even more important to have that relationship with the U.S. So who knows? But it is something that could affect. And, and I always think, you know, and, and those of us who've been in state government are well aware of this, you know, sometimes you can only focus on one thing at a time when there's big issues out there and certainly dealing with what would happen if the vote was to, for um, the U.K. to leave uh, the European Union, I imagine that would be quite a uh, traumatic upheaval that might take a lot of attention away from other things like trade agreements. So stay tuned and what happens on that. Then I just thought I'd mention two other things. One is we shouldn't forget, even though it's hard to keep all these balls in the air and remember about everything, but there's this other agreement which is being negotiated by I think 25 or 26 nations called the Trade and Services Agreement. And this goes directly to this point we've been talking about, like, are there all these, you know, service jobs? And this agreement is specific to making trade easier for people. And I would just, uh, you know, just to put in a, a perspective, you know, we heard potentially or definitely, I'm not sure, that Unum is going to be losing a lot of jobs. They're going somewhere else. Those are service jobs. Um, this is what TISA is about, Trade and Services Agreement. And the U.S. is pushing very hard to have this completed also this year. Uh, whether that happens or not, you know, again, nobody knows. Uh, but again, there's a lot of um, information about that. And at some point, this commission might want to know more about it because it affects things like the insurance industry. It affects, I mean, pretty much everything uh, that you can imagine is now called a service. And then finally, the last thing I thought I'd mention, it just came across my desk um, yesterday or today, and it actually is a NAFTA issue, since we've been talking about NAFTA, and it's one we've re visited before on softwood lumber. So I thought I would just mention this. Um, let's see if I have it. Um, because there's negotiations going on um, right now um, with Canada. Canada is ready to float lumber proposal with provincial options, and it basically is about this issue that we've been discussing, how much lumber can be bought or, or sold across the border and what the tariff levels are and all of that. And there was a separate agreement uh, associated with NAFTA that we had a whole presentation on. I'm not an expert on that, but it's been a hot-button issue between the U.S. and Canada and specific to the region of Maine where, of course, we have a lot of stuff with lumber. So it's an issue we might want to find out what's going on about that. Um, this was an article that literally came out today in, in the um, U.S. Trade, which is the subscriber service that I now have access to. So um, that might be something to, to find out more about uh, for the future. Uh, hold on. <laughs> yes, Luck. <clears throat> If, in fact, the Commission um, is interested in revisiting these topics, the TISA agreement and that, that other side agreement that you just mentioned about forest products, we, as Sharon mentioned, we, we have had presentations on that in the past, and I can easily go back and dig those up and bring that back to you, and then we could move on from there, given if, if there is an interest. We had a lengthy presentation from a fellow in Canada over the phone. I can't remember his name. Yeah, Scott, Scott's over there. Thank you. But, yeah. I, would, if, if I, might. I would just suggest that this agreement has been negotiated now for two more years since that presentation, right. which really just focused on public services. And there's a lot more 
to the TISA agreement than that issue, although that's a big issue. Mm -hmm. um, and so, it, I mean, it covers a lot of other things. And, you know, just to go back to the presentation we had earlier from, from the Margaret Chase Smith Center, one of the issues around China's um, purchasing power has been actually around the currency manipulation issue and the fact that actually TPP doesn't include anything about it is one of the issues around that. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of other, the, the TISA relates to a number of those other kinds of uh, sure. issues as well. Yeah. And, and we could, you know, try to dig up people that are knowledgeable about that uh, if there's an interest in finding out about it. Because it is happening. Uh, so we're focused on TPP now, but this is happening right now. And if, in fact, we're looking at more and more a focus on service jobs in this state, which it has, that's been the trend, and I don't think anything the TPP, I can predict, is going to change that trend in a different direction, then we ought to be paying attention to TISA because TISA will make it easier for professional jobs as well as those kind of service, low-level paying jobs that we think of, you know, at the local McDonald's or whatever, professional jobs, whether it's, you know, lawyers, doctors, radiologists, you know, uh, financial planners, all of that to, to be able to essentially be outsourced potentially, if mm -hmm. it goes in that direction. If it potentially comes in a positive direction, that could happen, who knows. But. And, what I, and what I intended to mean um, by the previous information is that, that could just be our starting point. Yeah. Here's what we know as of, here's what we'd already learned. I could bring that back to you and then supplement it with what's happened in the past couple of years and update it. Um, there's not a whole lot of press coverage about TISA right now, at least that I've been able to find. So I would welcome anyone who comes across articles uh, about TISA to send them to me so that I can provide them to you and also you know, become part of your understanding of what's going on with that. 